help the local government and the community to make the decisions that best suit their needs. Because obviously me sitting in at my home now or in my office previous to this, you know, I don't need what best is best suited to their needs. And so getting them to, you know, become part of the of the project and to develop those sustainable types of, of solutions is, is extremely helpful, as you all know. Um, and and will help this project to to you know go forward in perpetuity as needed you know without the help of, of Oregon Health Authority. Um, we will give assistance with trying to implement workable solutions. Again, we're still kind of in the throes of trying to figure out exactly you know what those are and how you know people are going to be able to actually implement those, especially given the fact that treatment options are very limited um, at this point in time. And then providing resources to, to uh, and, and contact information. So if they need help, regardless of whether it's a local community, local government, state agencies, um, federal agencies, you know, we we uh, in, in in industry for treatment and whatnot, we we want to make those those con that contact information, those resources available to them so that they don't have to come through me or, or Oregon Health Authority to get those. They can just go to um, this, this uh, uh, source to actually get the, that information. And then again, providing continuing technical assistance on an as needed basis so that they know that, I mean, there is a lifeline there if they need help, but the idea is again, to, to wean them off of any um, real help OHA is giving them so that they become more sustainable in the community. Next slide. And these are just examples of some of the risk communication, um, educational materials that we developed um, just for use, particularly on the lake. And again, if, um, these are successful. We hope to, to use them on other lakes that have similar problems or similar issues. Um, these actually did go out to all of the people that we had email addresses for, and we did get some, some uh, good feedback uh, that, that was incorporated into these um, materials. And I haven't sent these through our publications yet, um, but that will be done soon. So hopefully we can provide these not only um, through whatever avenues we have available to us, but also as links to our, um, our website. Next, I think that's it actually, yeah. So I'm a program of one. Um, I, uh, it's, you know, I'm not fully funded um, for this type of work. Um, so I have to do other things in the interim to actually pay for my, <laughs> my one FTE. So um, hopefully that will change sometime in the future. We'll see, uh, depends on our legislature. So that's it. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Are there questions for her? Uh, this is Dave Karen. Actually, actually, I had one. Uh, that was that was a really nice presentation, and I love the idea of a program of one. There there are less arguments that way. Um, you mentioned that you had fact sheets for owners, renters, vacationers, dog owners, et cetera, et cetera. How do you deal with the obvious conflicts that you face there? For example, uh, going through an Airbnb. Airbnb is not more liable to want to provide facts on potential hazards to possible renters. What do you do with that? Is there some way of getting around those kinds of barriers or hurdles? You know, you know, we obviously have had that particular issue as well come up. Um, I haven't had a chance to really reach out to them in, in depth. Uh, we had someone who was working with us who, who left uh, during COVID. Um, she was she was going to provide that. But, uh, so I haven't had a chance to do that yet. But one of the things that I was thinking about is, I mean, so when you rent, you know, properties, as you all know, if somebody were to get sick, you know, or, or ill, whatever, from drinking, and they could, they could, they could, you know, pin it back to, hey, I was drinking this, this water from the house, from the lake, you know, while I stayed there, and I, I became ill, um, you know, that, that becomes the owner's liability, right, so even though it may be difficult to prove that, and difficult to pin it on the owner, when or not, um, 
I mean, I hate to say that I use scare tactics, but sometimes I do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I use the liability issue somewhat, you know, uh, uh, you know, generally a little bit aggressively maybe. And so I, you know, for me, I was sort of thinking of, you know, I'm sure everyone's been to like a, a Airbnb or whatever, where you've had the little bulletin board that says, you know, don't do this, don't do that. If you're going to use this, do this. Um, and have the owners actually place a fact sheet or, or something that's easy to read um, on that bulletin board or wherever they put the information about the house and the things that you need to know. Um, so I, that's really kind of the only thing I've come up with so far. Thank you. Yeah, no, I've been in that exact situation where, unfortunately, I know the situation and uh, you you rent a house that um, you know, there's no information provided on that. And yet you can see that they have a private intake for water and, you know, there's concern there. I, th I think that's a there are, and there are liability issues which are problematic, obviously. So, um, yeah, tough job. But thank you. Yeah, great question. We have that issue on Clear Lake for sure. Um, any other questions for Rebecca? All right, um, we are gonna move into our lunch. We uh, made up quite a bit of time. So please uh, make it back by 12.55 and we will finish off with the rest of our presentations. So 12.55, thank you. And biointegrity bio uh, provision. And that's going to establish a framework to control eutrophication and biostimulatory substances such as nutrients, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and such. Um, but it's also going to ha have a um, bio biological integrity component too, which will be for all inland surface waters, enclosed bays, and estuaries. Uh, currently, we are um, considering potential goals and options for establishing the water quality objective. Um, and the program of implementation to achieve those goals. Uh, let's see, and the main goal of this project is to provide consistent protection um, of human health, recreation, and aquatic life beneficial uses um, from har har harmful anthropogenic eutrophication and biostimulation in our freshwaters. Um, which includes the streams, lakes, and reservoirs. We are also aiming to provide biological assessment tools to identify and protect biological integrity in weightable streams. This project is going is in three phases. So the phase that we're currently working on is the weightable streams component that we have, we're still in the beginning stages, as I've mentioned. So we're looking at a timeline of around 2024 to be finishing up this phase. Um, and that's going to consist of outreach, not only with regulators, but stakeholders. And then also we'll be um, presenting on a regular basis to CC Hab to gather your input as well. I know um, <clears throat> a lot of CC Hab's work does focus on lakes. That is something that is kind of overlapping um, with this project as well. Um, so a lot of lakes work is going to be coming as well. Um, but as for the weightable streams component, which is our primary focus right now, um, the goals are to amend the existing beneficial use de definition for wild and recreational one, um, and or consider a new beneficial use, which is to protect dogs and other domestic animals to ensure that there's protection of for these animals um, from ingestion or dermal exposure to pollutants such as cyanotoxins. Um, the other goal is to adopt a consistent statewide numeric or narrative water quality objectives for nutrients and other biostimulatory substances um, and biostimulatory conditions and cyanotoxins in freshwater rivers, streams, and lakes and reservoirs. Um, with, with regard to that, with the um, cyanotoxins, we are definitely keeping in mind the thresholds that are currently used or triggers um, that OWIMA or OWIHA has um, that are triggers to place signs for danger, caution, and so forth. So that is a big consideration when it comes to this policy, and we definitely don't want to step on any toes. So I just want to throw that out there because I know you a lot of you work with those numbers as well. Um, if a narr narrative water quality objective is established, 
um, there would be numeric thresholds um, to implement um, that those narratives. Uh, we are considering unique environmental settings such as engineered channels, and then we want to include an option to develop a region or watershed specific objectives or thresholds. Um, we all know that California has a lot of microclimates, so we're trying to take that into account as well. And again, um, nothing's set in stone just yet, so we may we're working on trying to find or work, um, yeah, working on different models that can translate um, a goal into numerics depending on the eco region or models that are somehow able to um, accommodate the entire state as a whole. Uh, and then we also want to include 303D listing assessment procedures. As for biological integrity, we would like to adopt a consistent statewide biological con condition and assessment method and scoring tool for assessing benthic macroinvertebrate and algae um, in weightable streams. For that, we would like to adopt thresholds for listing purposes, provide guidance for use as targets for TMDLs, focus on a nexus between the biostimulatory side and the biointegrity side. Um, we would also like to provide guidance for 303D list assessments and uh, let's see, to be used to assist in main, we would like to, we would like this objective to be used um, to assist maintaining high condition waters and, and improve other waters. So basically, um, wherever the water stands it with quality we're not it's an anti -deg degradation um, component essentially it's we don't want the waters to get worse so uh, with this objective we want to make sure that we're at least keeping everything as they are and moving in a positive direction rather than um, regressing and then with uh, with those objectives would come a program of implementation which we are considering two options one would be on a sector by sector basis uh where any we have the objectives i'm not sure i uh, sorry um i'm not sure who all works in water quality so um my my verbiage i'm just trying to make sure that i'm not coming off as a as like misunderstanding but um basically we would have the objectives and then for any for any um, entity that is not in compliance with that objective they have to uh, we have to follow an implementation plan to get them to meet that objective. So with that, we have two options, which are the sector, sector by sector basis. Um, the sectors that we have, there's many of them, but some big ones are agriculture, dairies, stormwater, grazing, um, NPDES permittees, MS4s, on-site wastewater treatments, and um, several others. So for the implementation plan, we're, we're thinking about writing a specific process that each of these types of sectors can achieve the water quality goal. That can include time schedules, um, credit trading, and things like that. We have not gotten too deep into implementation options just yet, but that's just one approach that we're thinking is to take into mind um, the specifics that are associated with each sector because they all are very different and then write an implementation plan according to those sectors. And then the other implementation plan that we're thinking is a watershed wide plan. Um, and there's four components of the watershed based approach, which would be for assessment, which would be compar comparing data, um, either field based or remotely sensed data, um, and compare that to the water quality objectives. Um, established monitoring requirements, um, and that would be include per permitting. Um, if the watershed is determined to be healthy, then we would use assessment tools for anti-degradation purposes um, to essentially hold the line and potentially improve the water quality of the watershed. But if the watershed is unhealthy, then it would move to the next phase of the watershed approach implementation plan, which would be a causal determination essentially um, doing monitoring to find where exactly um, impairments are coming from. And then we would have to move to the next phase, which, be, which would be control. Um, so once we get to the control, that's when the sectors come into place. So um, again, it would be like grazing, dairies, anim confined animal feeding operations, things like that. Um, and then, uh, 
depending and then from there it would just be kind of custom to how the impairment is occurring um, tmdls are a big way in which that we would address that um, that has to be listed on the 303d list things like that um, the potential requirements for point sources we would use effluent limitations and discharge requirements uh, we would likely um, promote some tertiary wastewater treatment and um, we are definitely looking for ways in which we can offer funding to different areas to start um, enhancing wastewater treatment and um, using tertiary treatment uh, we would use compliance schedules and sector by sector requirements for non-point sources we would encourage best management practices and identification and implementation use reporting, monitoring, adaptive management, use prohibitions where appropriate, and then use sector specific requirements for action plans, such as um, nutrient management plans. And then other control tools that we would like to use are uh, cleanup and abatement, restoration, and total maximum daily loads. And again, still in the early phases, so a lot of this can change, will change, um, and we'll be adding um, different ways of control as, um, as the policy progresses. And then the last phase of this watershed approach is an enforcement, which is to be used as necessary. Um, and we would defer, defer to the state water board's enforcement policy. Um, so I just wanna say that the difference between uh, those two implementation options, which is the sector by sector and then the watershed wide one is, um, with the watershed, we are doing a whole a holistic type approach, um, observing the watershed as a whole, and then there would be a prioritization of what sectors are contributing most to eutrophication and biointegrity, or um, low biointegrity, <clears throat> and then focus our efforts in that way. Whereas the sector by sector option is uh, it, it, we don't take that holistic approach and it's going straight to the sector by sector options and um, we begin the implementation there. So that's um, one of the decisions that we're currently, uh, we're just like thinking about the biostim team and myself. And um, the reason for it being so contemplative is because of uh, the amount of resources that we have, uh, we all know that um, resources are very limited. So it's just, um, we're trying to see how we can best implement this policy to get the best results out of it. Um, so if we can manage to basically get more bang with our buck using a holistic watershed approach versus um, more in-depth assessments on a sector by sector basis, um, we're, you know, that would obviously be desirable if it produces a better result. Um, with the within the limitations that we have um, when it comes to funding and staffing and things like that. Um, so that's pretty much it. There's a lot of science that goes into this project. We've been working very closely with SWERP um, and we are in talks. I'm not sure uh, if uh, Martha over at SWERP has reached, reached out to the co-chairs just yet, but uh, there are plans on getting the science onto future agendas so you can see what we're working with, what the science says, what models we're working with, and numeric thresholds that we are considering. Um, and then, as I said earlier, as we progress in this project, uh, we will be re regularly presenting to you, so you will be updated on, on what's going on. So um, I believe that's all I have for you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Joe. And any questions for Joe? And let's go ahead and move, uh, pull up the next uh, item while we're getting that to um, getting that together. Joe, that that was really interesting, and I, I look forward to um, you know to a more in depth discussion at a, a future CC Hub. Um, and where where is it that people can go? Would you be able to put a link in the chat for where people can go about that program? Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. And thank you all. Thank you so much. All right, we are moving into a presentation, Harmful Cyanobacteria in Frank's Tract, the 2021 Bloom and Mitigation Options. Um, this, uh, just a little story about this. Uh, there was a, a, a group of us who met um, virtually uh, with Rosemary and others from DWR 
um, about this very issue. And it was such an interesting discussion that um, that the co-chairs thought it would be great to bring it to a CCHAP meeting um, to hear what they've done at, at Frank's Tract, as well as um, you know be able to have a little discussion about it here as well. So thank you so much. And um, go ahead, Rosemary. Uh, you're sharing your screen, right? So there you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm really glad to have this uh, resource to um, yeah, share what's going on and hopefully get some feedback. Um, as Sarah said, I'm from the Department of Water Resources and uh, most of my work has to do with the environment in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta and the effect of state water project operations on the environment. Um, in particular, this past summer, we did a lot of research and monitoring surrounding um, the emergence of drought barrier. So as I'm sure most of you know, it was a very dry year this past year. And in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, where um, just if you're not familiar, smack dab in the middle of California, and it's the source of a lot of water for a lot of agricultural and um, urban uses. And uh, when it's very dry, we have less fresh water moving out of the Delta, which means more seawater moves up into the Delta. And this can cause a lot of problems for the water project operations. So we installed a giant pile of rock uh, across one of the um, uh, channels in the Delta right here um, on the west side of Frank's Tract. Frank's Tract is a state parks recreation area. It's a large flooded island, as they call it in the Delta. It used to be an agricultural island. Um, it subsided, the levees broke. It's now a, basically an open water lake. Uh, but that means it's relatively shallow, mostly like less than eight feet deep across the whole area. Um, it's heavily vegetated. And because it's part of this delta, there's multiple channels leading in and out. We only cut off one of those channels that reduce the flow through the tract, but there's still a lot of inputs and outputs. So it makes trying to get a handle on anything going on with water quality, very difficult to do. Um, on site. Uh, as I mentioned, it's heavily vegetated. This little plot just shows uh, some of the surveys we've done for vegetation and the dark blue is submerged vegetation. It's usually just full of aquatic weeds, most of which are non-native. Uh, and this past year, for the first time, we had a relatively large cyanobacterial bloom that was picked up um, by, this is the SFAI's um, freshwater cyanobacteria mapping tool, um, as well as some of our surveys that were going through the tract saw this. And, um, and the fact that this is the first time we've seen so much cyanobacteria in Frank's tract on a year that we put the emergency drought barrier in there, we're pretty worried that it might have been directly due to that emergency drought barrier. So um, I led a team that put together a study on this algal bloom and cyanobacteria in the Delta in general this past year. Uh, cyanobacteria in the Delta is mostly um, microcystis. That's at least the one that has had the most attention, but we also have a famous ominon, Velocipermum, Sinatoria. And microcystis was first seen in the Delta in the late 90s, but it's increased almost every year. We see more and more of it. There's been a fair amount of research on it, and we know that increased severity of these blooms is correlated to high temperatures, lower flow, and higher light. So still slow moving warm waters when we see these blooms. Um, we did, uh, we don't have really a cyanotoxin, regular cyanotoxin monitoring program for the whole Delta. We do have a number of other environmental monitoring programs that gave us information that helped us assess the cause of this bloom. Um, whenever one of our fish or water quality surveys goes out there, and that's all those black dots, they um, will do a visual assessment for whether microcystis is present. Microcystis looks like you know bright green cornflakes, so it's really easy to see. Other tacks are a little harder to recognize uh, for a layperson, but we are pretty confident when we see microcystis. Um, also marked in red are um, stations where we take regular phytoplankton grab samples. 
This is general phytoplankton. It's not targeting cyanobacteria in particular, but it's monthly, and we've been doing that since the 70s, so it's got a good long-term record of what the phytoplankton are doing. We also have pigment meta-analysis from uh, satellite data, like I showed in the previous slide, and um, from a fluoroprobe, which if you're not familiar, it's a, a sond that can not only pick up chlorophyll, but also other cyanobacteria, sorry, other phytoplankton pigments, including the phycocyanin that's indicative of cyanobacteria. We have a lot of water quality stations and a lot of flow stations. So we have a lot that helps us identify what causes cyanobacteria blooms. When we look at those visual assessments, which are all over the entire delta, and Frank's tract is this island right in there, so kind of dead center. When we look, you know, whole delta wide scale, looking what are the drivers when we tend to see cyanobacteria, um, flow is a pretty big driver. So right now we have delta outflow versus percent of observations where microcystis is present. And there's a pretty significant relationship, but there's definitely some fuzz there. Um, we also know that, as I mentioned earlier, heat makes a big difference. So 2020 in particular, there was a lot of hot days. This is number of days above 19 degrees C, which has been identified as cutoff for when we really start seeing big blooms. Also 2014, 2015, during the last drought of hot years. And we see a positive relationship with number of days above that um, threshold and percent of observations with microcystis present across the entire delta. Um, just looking at total number of samples, um, the dry, dry years that we, I outlined in red here, definitely see more microcystis on those dry years. Years with a barrier, so 2015 we had a barrier in exactly the same place and we didn't see a big increase in cyanobacteria. Um, 2020, we have the same barrier, um, but they kind of look like similar dry years. 20, sorry, 2021 had the barrier. 2020 was actually a little higher on the delta wide scale. Looking right just in close to the barrier, again, we see very similar um, amounts of microcystis in um, all dry years. We don't see a big effect of having that barrier there. However, however, um, let's skip that slide for now. Um, what really, you know, brought me here is the fact that on the delta wide scale, we've seen this low level of microcystis for years. It's a little worse the past couple of years, but it wasn't crazy. However, in late July and early August, we saw a big, dense bloom in Frank's tract itself, denser than anything we've had in one of the main islands in the Delta. We tend to get a lot in some of like the marinas and the Stockton Turning Basin, um, but areas with relatively high flow, like Frank's tract, usually don't see blooms this big. Um, of course, when I met with Sarah and some other folks earlier uh, and told them that our toxin levels were at 0.6 micrograms per liter. She's like, why, why do you even care? That's like nothing in comparison to um, Clear Lake. But uh, it's enough that we want to ideally not have to happen again. And if there is anything we can do, um, at least have a plan. Fortunately, none of these toxins uh, made it down to our pumps and collection court, but um, Still, we'd like to really understand what caused this bloom and if there's anything we can do to prevent it in the future. In terms of that cause, um, putting the barrier in here, we did some modeling. And this top plot here is the modeled water age or residence time. So um, how long the water's been sitting there with the barrier versus without the barrier. And that dark red, that's all water that's been sitting there a long time. So definitely, have ended up with kind of stagnant water in uh, the western side of Frank's tract in particular. We also modeled, you know, whether this change in water age would impact temperature. And we found that maybe half a degree increase in part of the tract, but not really that much. So an effect on flow, not so much on temperature. We saw that temperature was a big driver of um, microcystis blooms, but so was um, 
flow. So uh, that bloom could have definitely been partially caused by having this barrier there, but the temperature was still uh, a factor that we weren't really affecting as much. The other kind of wrench in the whole machine is the amount of vegetation. We don't have all of our survey data uh, processed for vegetation in 2021. You can see in this satellite photo, this like green mass, and that's all vegetation and filamentous green algae that's floating at the surface. When we look at the map of where the cyanobacteria are, it's like inverse of where all those weeds and filamentous algae are. I don't know whether that's because um, there's actually no cyanobacteria there or it's all just hiding under the weeds. But we know that they're both competing for the same nutrients. Uh, so I've had some people say, how do you even have nutrients left for the cyanobacteria when you have so many weeds there? We know weeds slow the water down, um, decreasing flow and uh, increasing water transparency, but they also shade the water under them. Uh, there also are periodically uh, herbicide treatments to try and control these weeds, which contribute more nutrients to the whole situation. Um, it also, having these weeds there makes a lot of the mitigation methods more difficult. Uh, if we're adding some kind of uh, algicide, it's not gonna flow through the track very well because the weeds are gonna block it. If we're trying to increase mixing, the weeds will uh, clog our pipes or um, just slow down the water movement. So we are, you know, looking into um, mitigation options. As Sarah mentioned, um, she met with some of us in, to kind of explore ideas. And we didn't have any like shining, this is the answer, unfortunately. Um, mixing methods definitely came up, but this is probably only feasible on a relatively small scale. Like if we target a few marinas or particular smaller areas of the tract, the whole area is so big that we're not going to be able to really do it on a tract wide scale. Um, Aldecides sort of have a similar problem uh, due to the you know, flow dynamics and size. We're probably not going to be able to treat the entire tract. Um, so that's again, finding targeted locations to pilot mitigation. Um, also the idea of using some kind of booms to skim uh, algae off the surface of the water came up. I'm not sure how feasible that is, but a lot of uh, discussion of nutrients, but because the impact of the barrier is on a very local level, we'd like to try and come up with something that's um, implementable on a local level rather than develop a basin wide nutrient management plan, which might have to happen in order to really get a handle on uh, harmful algal blooms in the Delta, but is beyond the scope of my program. Um, so our next steps is we're meeting with state parks and um, some other folks to talk about um, making sure our monitoring, if we do find harmful algal blooms in the future, we get the messaging out to the public in the right way and potentially find targeted areas to pilot um, some of these mitigation options. But the big thing is for now, we're increasing our monitoring to try and get a better understanding of the mechanisms behind um, these blooms, especially in regards to um, when we see increased toxicity and uh, looking at what the role of like benthic algae overwintering might be, what the interactions between these weeds and algae are. Um, a lot of open questions. That's all I had, but I would love to um, hear from the group if you have ideas for um, you know, what we can do to potential other mitigation options we haven't thought of, um, questions, ideas, concerns, et cetera. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, if people want to uh, just unmute themselves and you know raise your hand if you can but we're hoping this could be a bit of a discussion um rosemary you said you're going to be meeting with um uh just kind of continuing these meetings and identifying some pilot project areas what types of criteria are you looking for with uh with having a pilot project 
Um, I haven't gotten that far yet. You know, our first step, like I said, was to meet with um, state parks and we're setting up that meeting in a couple of weeks here. Uh, looking for areas that are high priority in terms of human use um, and trying to do that in a way that is, um, what's the word, uh, encompasses making sure we're uh, getting underrepresented communities on the table in targeting these areas. Um, and so high priority in terms of human use and a small enough area that we can potentially see an effect, but we are looking for things that we can do um, to prevent blooms and to act if we see something serious, um, but understanding that there's limited amounts that is gonna be possible. Um, we've got a question from Angela Dow. You mentioned three factors, but with the shallow status of the lake, is wind mixing been explicitly tested as a factor? And maybe that, com that combined with warmer temperatures is increasing the problem. Wind mixing was not um, something that we really looked at um, because of the weeds that are like floor to ceiling uh, in the water. I had, my conceptual model was that it wouldn't be that much of a factor. And also, um, have had a number of folks say that increased mixing would decrease the amount of um, cyanobacteria. The, uh, one of the surveys that went out there on a very, very still day was when we saw the most like thick surface film of microcystis. It really likes being right at the surface and when it gets mixed down, some of the other beneficial phytoplankton like diatoms can outcompete it better. At least that's my um, understanding of how it works. But if there are um, you know, wind effects that I don't know about, I'd love to learn. Angela, did you want to expound on that at all? No, I um, like the response. I uh, didn't realize the plants took up the whole water column. Um, which is kind of like, what's the competition? Because in lab studies, we've seen less cyanobacteria in containers that are full of plants or have macrophytes. So it's just kind of interesting that you're, you're seeing that, um, which made me think maybe there's just a super plethora of nutrients so everything can survive. And maybe the mixing is just redistributing that throughout the water column, bringing it to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and the plants are just taking it from the sediment and not their shoots, which leaves a lot for the cyanobacteria. That was my thinking, but we don't know. <laughs> yeah, and that's... Um... Definitely, as I was looking into mitigation techniques, there were a couple uh, places it was like, you can plant aquatic vegetation to stop your harmful cyanobacteria. I'm like, um, we got lots of that. That doesn't seem to be helping that much. But yeah, nutrient mixing. Um, I think one of the big problems is that we just have too much flow through Frank's track normally, and uh, it allows the nutrients to replenish relatively quickly just through, um, yeah. Um, Dave, it looks like you, you have a question. Also, Carly has her hand raised, and then we'll need to move to the next um, agenda item. Yeah, uh, less of a question, I guess, more of a comment. You know, that, that's a, it's going to be a complex little system. You've got so much submerged aquatic vegetation there that if you take action to kill it off, you're, you're going to be providing more nutrients to the cyanobacteria. Um, and, and wind is definitely a factor on a lake that is that wide and that shallow and it's going to be a mixed bag. It's not, wind is good for keeping cyanobacteria down and wind is bad, but it's going to be complex because you've got such a shallow water column, uh, you're going to get a fair amount of, of mixing, wind-induced mixing of turbulence. So it is, unfortunately, I think it's gonna be pretty complicated. Yep. Thanks, Dave. And Carly, you had your hand raised? Uh, yeah, I just first wanted to thank you, Rosemary. That was a great presentation. Um, you talked about working um, with some of the disadvantaged communities and messaging and the State Water Board. I just want to let you know our FHAB program has a ton of resources and we'd be happy to work with you on that. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and then secondly, um, 
you mentioned more frequent monitoring in 2022. Are you guys planning on doing more toxin analysis this year or what is that going to kind of look like? Definitely. So thank you. And we were definitely were planning on reaching out to the water boards in that conversation, you know, getting parks and the water boards together to figure out, okay, who has the resources and um, probably using a lot of um, the existing frameworks for messaging this kind of thing. Um, and in terms of increased monitoring, we are now going to be taking regular cyanotoxin grab samples from a number of stations around Frank's Tract. And uh, we're expanding a, a research project that had gotten started in 2021 at certain stations within the Delta that use uh, solid phase adsorptive toxin trackers, SPATs, um, as well as uh, water grab samples from a number of places throughout the Delta. You know, the original goal was um, looking more broadly at uh, cyanotoxins and cyanobacteria in the Delta, but we're putting one of those stations right in Frank's tract. So we have a little better idea of what's going on right there. Um, and we're working with the uh, folks at USGS who are experts on this and um, hopefully getting a better idea of where this is coming from, where it's going to, and um, what are some of the drivers. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to uh, the subcommittee and work group year end reports. And we're starting with Becky Stanton from OEA. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm here representing the um, Have Related Illness Work Group. Um, we do cover both freshwater and marine, but I just wanted to focus for this group on our freshwater work. Um, we have an ongoing uh, presence on the HAB portal with uh, the link is there and I can put it in the chat too for our HAB related illness work group page, as well as the pages on, you know, human health, dogs, livestock, fish and, um, and wildlife impacts. Um, and we try to do an annual update and we haven't done that formally yet. We'll get that on that website. Right now we're, we have through 2018 through 2020, but I wanted to just um, briefly share our preliminary results for 2021. Um, so we go through and any report that comes in through the HAB portal bloom report form, through uh, communication with the public or another agency, we follow up with, we work with um, the state board and the regional hub coordinators to do outreach and find out more um, and then try to follow up with the reporting party and the symptomatic individuals or um, the person who's associated with the, the animal that was impacted. So we do that and it does take a while because we're kind of piece together what we know about the illness, what we know about the environment. We might be waiting for lab results. And then we want to piece that all together and coordinate a response and then get back to all the parties involved. Um, so it does take a while. Um, as, as came up before, um, the voluntary guidance suggests that as that process is going on, that a, a caution sign be posted um, if we feel that it could be HAB related and we're going to get more information to make a determination. Um, it could also be um, a toxic algae alert sign if it's if it's likely to be benthic cyanobacteria as well. So we go through that process um, and then we basically do a determination. Um, yes, we feel it's HAB related. No, we feel like it's not HAB related or we're still working through it. Um, and I just wanna be clear that um, the not HAB related could be for a lot of different reasons. It could be, um, we got an initial report and the reporting parties never got back to us. It could be, um, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes we just couldn't get out to the site because of fire or smoke or a forest closure. And so we couldn't get samples within a timely fashion to make that connection. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't something there. It just means we didn't have sufficient information to determine it. Um, and so um, again, that's kind of, the, the no is kind of a mixed bag. And so we always try to be careful about how we frame that. Um, and so then the, the grand total number is just all the reports that we've considered um, with the extent of which we also had a cat case. And since we haven't had a cat case before, we didn't have a category for it. Um, 
and um, that one was was found dead in a stream that um, was suspected, but again, we um, weren't able to do an evaluation. So that one was uh, was a no eventually, but it's not shown on there. So we actually had 83 cases. And again, that's, that's not individuals. So we might have a case reported that has two dogs or a family. Um, and so that gets categorized separately, but for the purposes of these numbers, these are like an overall case. Um, so you go through, we started out with, with um, uh, pretty intense periods with the drought and um, we're never quite sure, you know, how things are going to ebb and flow um, over the season, um, but it did definitely end up being a, a higher number of ones that we evaluated overall for this year. Um, and again, we expect that's a combination of, of doing outreach as well as um, potentially more recreation as well as more um, potentially HABs. So it's a, it's definitely a combination and we don't necessarily have all the data to tease out why we're getting more numbers in a given year. Um, but so that's kind of where we're at. Again, we'll continue to do more outreach for the next year. We'll get our numbers finalized, get those posted on our HAB page. And again, we're continuing um, not only for the, the freshwater, but also the, the marine HABs. So happy to answer any questions or um, get opportunities to continue our outreach um, to different audiences. So thank you. Thank you, Becky. And when did you say it would be finalized by? Um, not sure. OK. It's We usually try for spring, and sometimes it's later spring, early summer. But um, yeah, we're like a five, five agency group. So that has its okay. benefits and complications. Now, do you do you ever um, show the data in terms of regions or water bodies? Because that would be interesting. Um, we have, let's see if it'll follow me. Are you seeing the website? Yes. OK, so what we have done, and again, uh, certainly for humans, there's concern with HIPAA protection because these are often low event numbers. So we have reported out by county. Um, and so that's we've done that sort of as a cumulative and then the most recent year. So that's how we've done it in the past. We've also talked about if we could get um, the technological support doing some, something like Tableau where it'd be more interactive, but um, we're just working through what our options are. Um, so people could kind of click on and off different areas or different years or different categories. Um, but yeah, at a, at a minimum, we've, we've done it at a county level. Gotcha. Um, any other questions for Becky? All right, thank you for that. Um, we have the mitigation subcommittee on the agenda. I, uh, is there anyone who can speak on the mitigation subcommittee year end? Dave? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't. And, and uh, I don't think Hugh uh, Dalton is on the line here. Yeah. All right. Well, that means that we get to jump into the next uh, topic, 2022 scheduling and planning. Um, we do have some dates that are, oh, there was a question. How do we join the mitigation subcommittee? Who is the contact for that? Dave, can you put in Hugh's contact info? Sure, I can chat. do that. Oh, thank you. And since Angela is asking for this, um, can you give a, just a blurb on how often the group meets and anything else that would be helpful? Because it is a great group and very active. I know uh, Katie Fong sends out the meeting invites. She's the water board support um and i think they've been doing monthly I'm trying to find that the last invite i think they took um one month off of the holiday but dave if you have any more details otherwise yeah no i don't um in fact i've i've thought that he was going to be jumping in and getting things rolling since he's taken over but i haven't seen anything 
Um, all right, so we'll be sh we will share some more information about um, the mitigation subcommittee. Um, we're going to put the contact info in the chat and make sure it gets into the minutes. Um, also on the CC Hub, there's a little bit of information. I'm going to put this in the chat on the subcommittees online. So it is probably a little bit out of date. Yes, but um, we'll be sharing uh, Hugh's. Okay, so Hugh's email is on there. Okay, um, so moving into 2022 scheduling, we do have an April date already. Um, the July date is being finalized. Let me pull up the April date. Um, it sounds like it's going to uh, be virtual um, at this point. That's what we're hearing. And the April CC Hab date is April 20th. Um, we are looking at early July and mid October. So keep an eye out for those dates uh, through the um, listserv. And um, also, we're taking some, uh, we're open to ideas for uh, topics, presentations, speakers um, for the uh, this year's meetings. So any thoughts on that? Are there any topics that people would like to see covered or a little more focused? You might not know who a specific speaker is uh, who could talk on it, but we could certainly reach out to people. So if anyone's got any thoughts on that, please let us know. Mike? Yeah, this is Mike Thomas with Region 1. Um, yeah. I believe Rich Fadness is planning to present on that benthic cyanobacteria report the next meeting. Yes, in uh, so the April meet, uh, meeting. So make sure April 20th, you've got that on your calendar and we will reach out to you about that. Um, I'm also gonna hold Hal McLean uh, down for um, the fisheries discussion that he offered um, in the chat. So we'll be reaching out to him on that. Um, any other topics that people would like to see covered that would be helpful? You can also, if you want, email me directly. Uh, this is Dave Karen again. Uh, if you just think of something offline and you know just throw it, want to throw it out there, I'll uh, probably be leading the contacts for that uh, meeting. So I'm happy to do that for the April meeting. Right, and I'll of course clear it with co-chairs. And and this is Becky. Um, I uh, co-lead the ITRC benthic HCB team and our guidance and training should be out this spring. So maybe that would be good to have a little bit of blurb with the region one um, project two on benthic. So if that works. No, that sounds great. Okay, well, if uh, anyone has uh, thoughts after this meeting about what they'd like to see in uh, future CC head meetings this year, please send an email to one of the co-chairs or to um, the FHAB program, it'll get over to us. Um, now we're, we'll zoom in ahead now, uh, open discussion. Um, I, I'd just like to say, I'm so glad that we were able to put a drinking water and HABs um, section together for this meeting. And it was great to hear from Rebecca Hillwig from Oregon. And I was really glad we got to share um, what we've been doing over at Clear Lake. I, I know that um, it's there aren't a lot of water bodies in California that necessarily have the situation that Clear Lake does, but it's certainly worth um, confirming whether people are, um, you know, legally or illegally drawing uh, water for their own household use. And um, it's great to have programs where you can you can uh, test it and see what's going on. Um, so glad to get some people from uh, who have presented at NALMS. Um, certainly these, these meetings that are happening um, that calms NALMS or, or any other um, lake management group, if you come across a presenter who uh, is um, great and you'd love to bring them to CC Hab, just get in touch with one of us and you know we'd love to, to have them on as well if, if it makes sense. So um, that's a great, uh, great to go to those, uh, those uh, annual meetings and get people to bring over here. We've got a lot going on in California and it's great for them to hear what we're doing as well. 
Um, uh, Co-chairs, do you have any last thoughts? Um, anything you'd want to cover? Not um, that I can think of. I'm sorry, Becky, go ahead. That's okay. I was just going to mention one thing since Sarah brought up drinking water again. Um, we did find in, in going through the process that um, Washington State does have a similar situation and they had some guidance that we found was useful and I was trying to pull it up quickly to put the link in the chat mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, what to do before and after a bloom for for those as well um, and they had pretty high anatoxin A um, in the lake so that was useful for us. Um, the other thing that came up earlier that I um, just thought I'd follow up on is um, the um, household certification for microcystins for a filter. Um, that's interesting in that the certification requirement is only for four microgram per liter to get down to 0.3. So the testing for that and kind of the way it's described is, is more a polishing step, um, not necessarily um, tested for the extreme situation of, of someone pulling in uh, raw lake water with um, certainly as high as we were seeing with Clear Lake. So just kind of a caveat to that certification. It's certainly helpful that some have gone through that, but again, it's kind of a, a portional or a certain certain uh, situation under which it was tested that may not make it completely broadly applicable to um, any microsystem level in, in a lake that you're going to bring through that. So just a caveat there. Becky, when you're saying tested, are, are you saying like a like a, a certified type of filter you can buy that is making claims? There is there is one um, and I forget the number. It's like a four digit code and a staff certification um, mm -hmm. that was met by one uh, like commercially available um, in home treatment system. But again, it's it's that testing certification required of four microgram per liter microcystin going in, and then they had to achieve 0 0.3 coming out. So, um, and and it's described as being something that you could use to achieve 0 0.3 as kind of a, again, I forget the right term, but kind of as a polishing for a, a not necessarily, a, you know, you could have a raw water intake into a lake and this this is guaranteed to meet 0 0.3 no matter what your intake concentration is. It's it's not that broad. But there is one that that met that certification standard that I'm aware of. And I think that's the one Rebecca was mentioning. And I think doesn't anatoxin so you're talking about microcystins. So don't uh, other toxins have different sizes? Um, that certification is very specifically only for microcystin. Yeah. There was no testing that I'm aware of for anything else. The other toxins. Yeah, that was certainly an interesting part of, um, you know, this this the drinking water tap program we have at on Clear Lake is really learning more about. Um, what actually could work, you know, we're different size cyanobacteria, different size toxin, really need to, that's why the microscopy and the toxin analysis is so important. Um, all right, any other thoughts before we close early? Thank you all for, uh, for coming, staying to the end. Um, we will be putting, let's see, so the presentation will be on YouTube, right? on the Water Monitoring Council um, YouTube uh, channel or page. Um, the minutes uh, might just point us to where each agenda topic is on the YouTube. Um, we'll be working with Joe Westhouse on that. So, um, and Becky has a few things in the chat. Thank you for that. All right, well, that is all from my end, unless there's any other questions. Thanks all for attending. Um, the regional uh, year-end reports were great. Subcommittee uh, work group year-end reports were great. Really appreciate everybody's um, thoughtfulness and work in putting this together. And thank you, Becky and Dave, for all your support.
Sure. Thank you. Great job, you, Sarah. Appreciate next it. Next time, next time we'll get all of the audio visual glitches worked out. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> all righty. Thank, Thank you. Thank so you much. all. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.